I'm on is over the next 40 minutes or so is discussing the basics of nystagmus in infancy and childhood. But in preparation for that, anything that I present during this lecture, and almost everything has some more depth in it, is in uh, Dr. Lou Deloso, and who's uh, been my science partner for almost 30 years, and our textbook, which you see down in the, on the left-hand side, if you're looking at the screen. And it's the, if you go to that website, omlab.org, you can download the entire textbook with the references, with the videos, with all of the appendices for free. The, the publisher has stopped publishing the book, so Lou and I are making it available to the entire group of people who want to see it. <clears throat> these, are, these are a list, a list I, I have not mentioned everybody, but these are the people over the last 25 years who've really helped me with a lot of this research. And these are a couple of little puppies who've helped as well. None of this work could be done in isolation. All of, I think that the best work in science right now is done by groups of people. A scientist working or a clinician working alone now, it's very difficult to try and accomplish anything, I think, substantial. I'm gonna talk first about naming and classification. The types of nystagmus and how they're classified, how they're named has been changing for as long as people have been observing involuntary movements of the eyes. And this is a, a classification system that's still present in many textbooks where a lot of the systematization, system, the classification systems are based on our our own observations of the nystagmus with or, with, with or without some historical context, like they came out of a mine or a mine worker and they have their eyes are oscillating, so it must be miner's nystagmus, or pure directional diagnoses like upbeat or downbeat, which are still used today. And I would suggest that these types of classification systems based purely on the physical appearance and his, historical teaching in other words, this is what I was taught, this is what I was taught, this is what I, what I was taught, really doesn't satisfy what we need in modern medicine. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't include those eye movement abnormalities, as you see in this young baby who had uh, non-accidental trauma with a severe cortical injury. And as a matter of fact, his EEG was silent on the cortex, and he has this ocular and lid flutter that's associated with severe brainstem disease. Mm -hmm. And these are saccadic oscillations. So nystagmus is a disorder of the slow eye movement system. There are basically two systems, a slow eye movement system and the fast eye movement system. A slow eye movement system is responsible for vergence and pursuit and BOR, and the fast eye movement system is responsible for the saccadic system. And the slow eye movement system is the one that's perturbed in nystagmus. So fast eye movement abnormalities can look clinically like nystagmus, but they're completely different. In 1968, uh, a very famous neuro-ophthalmologist, David Kogan, suggested and actually helped ophthalmology and neurology by defining two groups of children. A group of children who could see well and whose eyes oscillated, as opposed to a group of children who couldn't see well and whose eyes oscillated. And he called those sensory and motor and congenital nystagmus because his assumption was that it began at birth and it was associated, one was due to problems with the sensory system and one was due to problems with the motor system. In the 1970s, Bob Daroff and Lou DeLasso at Boston Palmer Eye Institute recorded from the eye movements of these children and found that the eye oscillations, the nystagmus waveforms were exactly the same in the group of children who could see and the group of children who couldn't see. As a result, they published this and presented this at one of the academy meetings. And Dave Kogan in 1974 wrote a letter to Bob Daroff saying, basically, you know what? My old classification system is wrong. We should have a different classification system based on the eye movement abnormalities. That was in 1974. It's 50 years later, and I still hear talks where people say this is uh, motor and sensory nystagmus. And Ian, the guy who defined it said it was wrong, and it still, it still goes on. So that shows you how much human beings make a difference in medicine and not how science makes a difference in medicine. And that's kind of a theme for me throughout a lot of this. So 
when, in the late 90s and the early O's, we began a, uh, a classification system meeting, which has persisted to this day and has resulted in a document that's available at the website you see here on the classification of eye movement abnormalities and strabismus. And this was the work of an integrated multidisciplinary group of clinicians and scientists from multiple fields, optometry, neurology, psychology, ophthalmology, pediatrics, who had interest in eye movement disorders. And this is about a 90 page document and I'll be using this classification system to define these oculomotor abnormalities today. This is the nystagmus types as, de as defined by CMOS and the three that I'll be discussing this morning are the most common that are seen in infancy and childhood and this is INS or old congenital, fusion maldevelopment nystagmus or old latent, manifest latent and spasmus nutans syndrome. This child you see here has achiasma with seesaw and infantile nystagmus. If you look very carefully at his nose, you'll see that one eye goes up and the other one down, one up and, and extorts, the other up and in torts, and then down and, and extorts and up and in torts, as well as the horizontal oscillation associated with INS. I'll talk a little bit more about achiasma later. And this is a little baby with a form of prematurity and looks like what would be called a esotropia with upbeat nystagmus. And if, the, if eye movement recordings are done on this child, he actually has increased in velocity, slow phases, characteristic of infantile nystagmus with a predominant vertical component with the jerk an up direction and the slow phase abnormality down direction. One of the things that is very important in trying to understand infantile nystagmus syndrome is and what we've learned is that it's not congenital. And the way that we, I discovered this is by asking the parents, specifically mom, if you get up and say to mom, when you have this beautiful new child and you wipe the mucus out of, out of its eyes and you look in the eyes for the first time, which most moms do, <laughs> did you notice eye oscillations? And moms will say no. And the next time they really look at the child's faces, the first time they're breastfeeding, and I'll ask them, did you notice when the child's eyes were open during breastfeeding in the first day or two that the eyes were wiggling? And the moms say no. And then I'll ask them, when you leave the hospital, which used to be about five days, now it's like five minutes, and everybody was together, all the family, the immediate family, siblings, did anybody, even the, in the newborn nursery or the primary exam, notice that the eyes were wiggling? And they'd say no. The next big visit is the week after, which is the well baby check at the pediatrician. So I asked, did the pediatrician notice anything or you notice anything at the well baby visit? And families remember this and they say no. And we actually were been able to follow some children who did not have nystagmus to when they developed nystagmus. And it is an acquired developmental disturbance in the oculomotor system. It's acquired after birth. It's not present in the womb. There are a couple of genetic forms or severe intrauterine abnormalities where oscillations can be present at birth, but that's not classic for infantile nystagmus, especially in conditions like you see down on the left, which is oculocutaneous albinism associated with INS. And this is when I was in China and it was around 100 families with uh, OCA type 1, which is a very unique experience to study this disease. There are some important peculiarities of the examination technique in patients with nystagmus that I think are slightly different than what we routinely do in our taught. Rich, can I go back to the last slide, please, just for a question? Sure. Um, I, I'm just going to pick you up uh, on the pregnancy and maternal drug use. Essentially, we know that um, maternal drug exposure and prematurity have been associated with uh, nystagmus. There's a lot of in vivo studies looking at uh, opiates and benzodiazepines working on the mu receptors, um, particularly with downbeat nystagmus. Um, surely those patients will have some other kind of neurological dysmorphic uh, phenotype. So are there any specific drugs that you would ask a patient in terms of intrauterine use and, and, and sort of um, drug use in, in that regard? Uh, I, I think it's part of the routine history, maternal labor and delivery of the pregnancy with drug use. That's what we consider part of our routine history. And there is an association between uh, drug use, neurological damage, and the onset of oculomotor abnormalities. But it's rare to have a pure oculomotor abnormalities without other neurologic abnormalities with a history of drug abuse. So even, for instance, a basic esotropia 
in, in a mother, a previously uh, drug addicted mom or opiate use mom is unusually related to the opiate abuse without associated neurologic abnormalities. And the types of eye movement abnormalities present in particularly withdrawal, uh, cocaine or mixed drug withdrawal or opiate withdrawal are a, a combination of pendular oscillations and infantile oscillations. And as I'll point out, there seems to be a final common pathway in the developing brain that produces the motor oscillation of INS. And one of those perturbations that can result in the domino effect could be drug abuse. So yes, maternal drug abuse with associated neurological damage that you could see even in CP or prematurity with a grade three to four IVH also result in the oscillation of IV INS because it is a link in the, kinal, in the common final pathway to the development of this oculomotor oscillation. The, uh, the examination techniques, uh, really there's a few things that I think are, are particular to this patient population. And it, we have to remember that INS and most forms of childhood oscillations are a dynamic condition. The patients do not have a visual system that is static, essentially static, like you and I. And the way that I describe this to families is that I'll, I'll go down in the in the morning and, and smell breakfast cooking and it smells great and five minutes later I don't smell anything because I have up and down regulations in the neurologic systems in other senses like hearing and smell. In the eyes, yes, there's some changes with um, light conditions, so mesopic and photopic and scotopic conditions change it, but vision is pretty much stable and independent of my mood, uh, other bodily functions, position, eye position in orbit. And this is not the case with these patients. Their visual functions change as a function of time, affect, medications, uh, their, their fatigue level, sedation, sleep. And so checking visual functions, we have to remember it's like checking blood pressure or blood sugar. It's an instant check of vision at a certain time, in a certain way, in a certain mood. This is why when we do objective testing of eye movements, I always try and get them the recordings done with them in the same situation as much as possible so that we get uniform recordings. Mm -hmm. You want to allow the child to be tested under binocular conditions first, first, before you cover an eye and get in their personal space so you can see what they do with their head over time. And a Checking the vision of the binocular conditions over the course of two to five minutes will actually allow you to observe whether the head position is static or dynamic as well. It's important to check the retina, not only for all the things that we check for, but about 85% of patients with infantile nystagmus syndrome now will have some diagnosable form of associated visual system abnormality, either in the afferent system like uh, optic nerve or foveal abnormalities, or uh, of genetic diseases particular to nystagmus like FRMD7. It used to be about 50 to 60, when I first started, about 60% to 65% of patients had associated sensory system abnormalities diagnosed. 35% of patients with this were idiopathic. It's now switched about 85 to 90% have some diagnosable associated afferent system disease especially using OCT, you'll diagnose foveal dysplasia in many, many patients who you didn't think had it before just based on looking at the fundus. It's very important to get a good accurate fundus uh, refraction because still to this day, a lot of patients are unrefracted or not given their refraction. Rich, we've got a lot of guys from Oxford who are sitting their exams soon. Could you just emphasize the importance, both in exam settings and also when you're doing the examination, to maintain the patient in a neutral position, primary position, before doing these investigations? Could you miss common diagnoses otherwise? Yeah, I think that, so the, the eye movement examination for me in the clinic really is objective and subjective. So the subjective examination allows the patient to do what they need to do to attain their best visual function with their head or their eyes. And then the objective examination allows, allows me to position their head in a, as a reference point. And then I, I separate it up when I teach into two things. I examine the strabismus first and ignore the oscillation. Then I examine the oscillation and ignore the strabismus. And I do this with alternate cover in all positions of gaze at distance and near and with head tilt. And if you look at the, and then I look at the nystagmus for three to five minutes by having them fixed with their head straight ahead 
and using their preferred eye with monocular cover. And I'll talk about that with period when I talk about periodicity. So to do a good eye movement exam takes somewhere about five to eight minutes. And in most ophthalmologists' office, that's about 16 patients who are ready for cataracts. And so you're seeing one patient for every 16 patients a general ophthalmologist is seeing. And that's one of the reasons this doesn't get done, I, I think. <laughs> so uh, the techniques that we use for objective evaluation of the eye movement system are the ones you see listed here. And eye movement recordings, I think, are invaluable in diagnosing the type of eye movement abnormality, evaluating its effect uh, of your treatments, any treatment, and also determining the prognosis of whether or not a treatment may be effective. It also helps with understanding what treatments you could use. And without going into tremendous, again, a lot of this is written, but we use eye movement, I use eye movement recordings for diagnosis and, and treatment, both. It, this is for me is routine. And down on the right is a remote video eye movement recordings this costs anywhere from a minimum of about 25,000 to as much as 70,000 to use in the office. It's very, that has very facile pop down uh, program that anyone can use to diagnose the nystagmus. I teach my fellows and residents how to do this in the span of a couple of months. And I don't think any ophthalmologist who's not used a piece of equ equipment and learns how to use it in their practice could use this as well. For instance, many ophthalmologists trained before OCT and now use OCT with no problem. Many op ophthalmologists trained before using intraoperative diagnostic software for their refractive surgery and the use of the new modern lenses for toric lenses have now learned how to do that. This is no more complicated than that. So using eye movement recordings is really the al allows us to evolve in understanding and the treatment of these. And it's not gonna be this generation. Hopefully in two generations, uh, the, this will be routinely used by those people who study or treat patients with eye movement disorders. So can I just confirm that with the EMRs, you, irrespective of whether, for example, we are doing specifically surgical planning and monitoring results, are you saying that each patient will have EMRs in your, in, in your, in your practice? So I see 20 to 25 patients with nystagmus a week, five new, and do five operations on nystagmus a week. Every single patient gets a recording every time. It takes, uh, it takes about uh, seven minutes to do the recordings. Mm -hmm. And it takes me about uh, five minutes to do the analysis for a clinical use, for scientific mm -hmm. use, to look at foveation periods and more detailed science, it, it can take 15 minutes to 30 minutes per patient to do the uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. I lost my arrow. Uh oh. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. These are the waveforms that are present. This, these are the only possible waveforms that are present in all types of nystagmus, every one. The ones that are blocked out in red mm -hmm. yeah. are those with acquired nystagmus. So acquired nystagmus either has a pendular, pure pendular waveform, or a pure linear waveform. All of the other waveforms that you see here are, are infantile nystagmus, especially with this one. This is a dual jerk. This mm -hmm. actually happens to be uh, particularly significant and associated with some forms of retinal disease. There's been some recent literature suggesting that that this is diagnostic of uh, a retinal ganglion cell instability, but we can discuss that later if you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can get into some of the theoretical debate about that at some point. But these are all infantile waveforms, infantile nystagmus waveforms. So what else do, do my patients get? Because I need to figure out what's wrong with their afferent system. So every single patient that I see with INS at least once gets all of this testing done gets uh, what you see here listed, and especially VEPs and ERGs. I do contrast sensitivity function because I'll show you, I think CSF is a better test of visual function than acuity is in terms of relating to what happens in the real world. All of my patients get OCT, most of them get biopsygen, which is the, uh, not the real time, but the high def OCT, 80,000 scans per second, which allows very clear images of the fovea and retina and optic nerve, even with the ongoing oscillation. 
This is a, a slide that I use for most clinicians because most people don't use eye movement recordings to determine benignity. In other words, if you see increasing velocity slow phases on the eye movement recordings, the chance of the nystagmus being due to a brain tumor or some neurologic process needing an MRI is very unlikely. So I don't order a lot of MRIs. I will order a few. But many, many patients that I see in consultation from around the world come in with MRIs because they're concerned, the clinicians are concerned they're going to miss something. So if the child has nystagmus plus something else in the eyes or systemically, then it's reasonable to do neuroimaging. But if the child has what you see down here on the left, then it's more than likely going to be completely benign. And the, ch and the chance of seeing something positive on MRI are minimal. And I would suggest that you're, you have every medical right to not get an MRI in those patients. Mm -hmm. I think I agree with you. I think we over image patients and that has a massive implication in children. So just to confirm, you would diagnose INS or FMNS just on a clinical assessment alone. Right. Especially FMNS. So there's never been a reported case where you have either a latent component with INS where it changes direction or intensity and you have, or in strabismus with changing direction, and you've had brain disease. So a latent component is really a sign of benignity. And just, uh, just touching base on the OCT. So it's my understanding that essentially uh, one is looking for the continuation of the normally absent inner retinal layers across the fovea, which is of course pathological. Can you just elaborate a little bit about foveal hyperplasias, typical versus atypical, please? Yeah, the, there's been a classification system that's worked out by our colleagues over where you are, Gurjeet and, and uh, Irene Gottlob and all of our colleagues that show they have actually graded the level of foveal hypoplasia based on the, the amount of persistence of the inner retinal layers to the, the, the where there's zero or none when you have a beautiful foveal uh, where there's no persistence of the inner layer and a normal appearance of the foveal pit to where the fovea looks like the peripheral retina and you can't distinguish it. And there's a gradation of persistence of the inner retinal layers that go from zero to four. And I think this grading system is very nice to use. Fantastic. So this is the INS diagnostic box from the CMAS classification. And it has a diagnostic component. So on eye movement recordings, there's no other disease that has an accelerating slow phase where there's a high gain instability that causes the nystagmus or a, a feed forward mechanism. The harder you try and see, the worse the nystagmus, the more intense, the more intense emotion, the more intense the person, the, uh, it's time that you'll see this. The more, they, the more effort they have to see, the, the worse the, the nystagmus. So there is a, a feed forward mechanism that's the best way to explain, I think in lay terms, what an increasing uh, velocity exponential or high gain instability is. The other way I like to explain it is, if you have a bubble gum and you put it in a penny and get out one piece of bubble gum, that's the bubble gum machine is operating at zero gain. If I put in a penny and get out two pieces of bubble gum, then I'm getting a high gain machine. So for each penny of vision, you get out two pennies of ocular motor function. And the more that you put in, the more that you get out. And that's what the increasing velocity exponential slow phase represents. This is a peculiarity that really needs to be examined for clinically and with eye movement recordings and is present in 17 to 33% of patients with INS. If you look at this young woman, in addition to her esotropia, which you'll see with cover on cover, watch her nystagmus and it changes in intensity and direction spontaneously over the course of approximately a minute and a half. Her nystagmus intensity is increasing regardless of whether I put the cover up or not. Spontaneously increasing and her, if you let her, her head will change directions too. And if you do eye movement recordings on her, this is what it looks like over the course of about eight to 10 minutes. Up is right, is down is left, and this is a velocity trace. The eyes jerk very rapidly to the right, slow down and almost stop, and then jerk rapidly to the left, slow down and stop, jerk rapidly to the right. There's no rhythm in the body, and I've looked, 
from the brain to the gut and the heart that has this regularity, none other than periodic alternate, pure periodic alternating nystagmus. Most patients with infantile nystagmus and PAM actually have aperiodicity. So they may have 10 seconds to the left, about 20 seconds stop, and then five seconds to the right. And then the next cycle takes place two minutes later and is 30 seconds to the left, five seconds quiet, and two minutes to the right. So there, it's not periodic, it's aperiodic, which makes it even more difficult to diagnose. And it has to be examined with either eye movement recordings or this trick. And here's the trick to do it. Even if you're a busy clinician, patch a non-preferred eye or one eye if they're both equal, keep the patient's head fixed straight, have them look straight ahead at a target for five minutes, videotape the eye that's looking straight ahead videotape it, even if it has a latent component. If over the course of the five minutes, there's a significant change in intensity or direction of the eye with them looking straight at the same thing undercover, they have periodicity. And you can actually fast forward your videotape on your little camera so that you're able to diagnose it all. So the final common pathway really involves a complex understanding of a higher order development of the brain. And I don't even understand this. And even though I've been trying to look at this for many, many years, <laughs> what I'll tell you is what my understanding is in very simple terms. Most of what the brain does is talk to itself. Although we don't think so because we feel so much and sense so much. We think that's what the brain is doing. Our thoughts and our behaviors and our sensations are what the brain is doing. But actually, most of brain activity is taking place subconsciously by the brain talking to itself. And in early development, the developing ability to see and the developing ability to move the eyes talk to each other continuously. That's part of the developmental process. If that connection between the two, if the communication system between the two is disrupted in intrauterine or even immediately after birth, then there's a, there's a disabling of the development of the oculomotor system. And I'll give you the, the example that everybody's familiar with. In conception, there, uh, the, the child is, is doing fine. During growth, the child's doing fine. The, the child develops a cataract in utero. No problems. The child doesn't need light here. Everything's fine. The motor system is fine. The sensory system is fine. But at birth, the child now needs formed vision. If the child has bilateral complete congenital cataracts between birth and early infancy, and the brain does not get formed vision in each eye, then there's a disruption in the communication and the child will get infantile nystagmus syndrome. If we restore formed vision, in this sensitive period of development, not only will vision get better, but the nystagmus, if, even if there's an early onset of the nystagmus, will actually get reversed and go away, or it will never develop. So it's the same, pro what we're inhibiting or developing or enhancing is not actually this as much or this as much, but the development of this communication, which is why any problem here in the retina, the optic nerve, like in albinism or optic nerve hypoplasia or developmental diseases of the retina and phobia like labors or congenital abnormalities of the RPE or photoreceptors will cause infantile nystagmus because all of these systems will result in disrupt dis developmental disturbances here and the final common path will then be INS. It's interesting that where it's affected in infancy, we, we believe may cause mixed forms of INS and FMNS based on whether there's also the associated development of infantile strabismus. So it's even more complex than we thought. And what used to be called latent nystagmus, actually we got rid of that term because when patients with INS have an eye covered, sometimes they can look like latent nystagmus, many times they can. But this diagnosis is made by eye movement recordings and clinical examination because of the significant difference between the two. And the next, the next two slides will point this out pretty easily. Here's a patient with a small angle esotropia and a right eye preference, and maybe a little bit, but not significant head posture. And she looks like she has no nystagmus with the eyes open under binocular conditions. Once we cover each eye, what you'll see is a changing intensity nystagmus and an associated esotropia. Jerk left with the left eye covered and 
when we cover the left eye, you'll see a jerk right nystagmus, but less intense. So this is a patient that used to be called pure latent nystagmus. But if you do eye movement recordings, what you see under binocular conditions is a constant oscillation in the direction of her preferred eye, which is her uh, left eye, sorry, and her preferred left eye. So she has jerk left nystagmus all the time. But you don't see it clinically unless you look hard with the slit lamp and look at the limbal vessels or the vessels of the retina. Then when you cover the right eye, she has more intense jerk left nystagmus with a linear slow phase. When you cover the left eye, she has jerk right nystagmus with a decreasing velocity or linear slow phase. So this is pure, this is latent nystagmus or fusion maldevelopment. Now here's the child with high myopia, previous ROP, and amblyopia of the left eye and has a strong preference for the right eye. And he has esotropia with a jerk left nystagmus with the left eye covered and a jerk right nystagmus with the right eye covered. So he must have also fusion and maldevelopment or latent and he does. He has infantile nystagmus with a latent component. Under both eyes open, he has a jerk right nystagmus with increasing velocity slow phases with a right eye preference. And here you can see with his left eye, his fixation is very poor and unstable. And with the right eye, it's an increasing intensity when he's under compared to both eyes open, but still has jerk right with increasing velocity exponential slow phase. So here's a child with INS and a latent component. And you cannot tell the difference between these two clinically. And just to cut to the chase, the treatment for fusion maldevelopment, the primary treatment, especially surgical and medical, is to promote fusion. The primary treatment in INS involves a combination of medical, optical, and surgical treatment. So it is important to differentiate these two. The last is spasmus nutans syndrome, which is a very peculiar triad of high frequency, asymmetric, disconjugate ocular oscillations beginning in early to mid infancy and disappearing, quote unquote, in the, in the toddler years. It actually never disappears if you do eye movement recordings. But it has a characteristic oculomotor abnormality. And also that the other two head, head things are head bob. This head bobbing is different than the head oscillation associated in 30 to 40% of patients with infantile nystagmus syndrome, whose head oscillation is almost purely horizontal. These kids have an elliptical three-dimensional bobbing that occurs in pitch yaw and roll. And the eye op movement abnormality is characterized here by a disconjugate oscillation. So this eye is moving to the left while this eye is moving to the right. You can see that the fast component is 180 degrees out of phase. So there, this is a totally disconjugate oscillation. And there's very few oscillations, maybe one other one, convergence retraction, but that's actually ocular, ocular flutter, but looks, looks disconjugate that ever occur, especially in infancy. Now, this has been associated in some patients with optic pathway gliomas. The, this is a tenuous association, and no one's ever really done the full eye movement evaluation and clinical evaluation of all of these patients. In my patient population, if I see a patient with SNS, I will do an MRI. I found one patient who's had a, a um, tumor where they looked completely like this, this patient did not have a tumor and that had an abnormality in the uh, optic pathway. So I think that this is a, it's such a rare condition that it's probably worth until we understand more to get an MRI before we can really differentiate between those kids with SNS that don't have an optic pathway abnormality and those kids with SNS that do have an optic pathway. Interestingly, the eye movement recordings in kids with tumors are slightly different than this. This is a pretty typical eye movement recording of an idiopathic SNS patient or one without any CNS abnormalities. So what are the visual system abnormalities in INS patients? I'm not gonna read the slide, you can see them here. This is a beautiful photograph from uh, Dr. Kaisman Kellner's paper and her excellent work showing the aoptic pathway and chiasmal abnormalities in patients with albinism with the lack of width of the optic chiasm due to the loss of the, the ipsilateral fibers. But these, all of these visual functions are affected in patients with nystagmus. And so this is the spectrum from which we can begin treatment. I want to spend a minute on this slide because everybody uses the head posture 
as a direct correlation with the eye movement abnormalities as the null position. So the clinical null position or the head position in space is actually a complex combination of static and dynamic factors associated with the nystagmus that you see above the yellow line and those factors not, associated, not due to the nystagmus. So, and the, with the nystagmus, there's static and dynamic issues. There is a position in three-dimensional space in about 60% of patients where the nystagmus is the least. It could be right, left, up, down. It's almost always not single plane. It's a multi-planar deviation, but it can be close to the horizontal, close to the vertical, or close to a pure torsion. Here's a child with a left tilt and a chin down position. So it also can damp with convergence. That's a static damping of the angle of the nystagmus. It's dynamic in that if you ask the child to fix with one eye or the other, they may have afferent system abnormalities in one eye. They may have a latent component and that will change the head posture. It will change if you ask them to pursue it will change if you ask them to, to, look at a VO, to look at their VOR, and it will change if you stimulate them with, this, with an OK and drum, their head position. And this is what I'm talking about, the head position. And the head position will change if they have periodicity or aperiodicity. If they have an intense period of jerk right nystagmus, they're going to have a right face. If they have an intense period of jerk left nystagmus, and they want to fixate during that, because they may not care to fixate, may not see a head posture. So unless you're checking their vision every 30 seconds for 10 minutes, you may not see them change when the intensity changes. I know this is very complex, but this is what gets in the way of sometimes treating the head posture surgically and coming up with a surprise surgical outcome. It's also affected by the vision in one or both eyes or binocularly. It's affected by the associated presence or absence of strabismus. It's affected by the associated presence or absence of secondary changes in the spine neck or back, and it's also affected by a process which we've been evaluating recently where there's an internal gyroscope in the, in the brainstem and cerebellum that says my head is straight in relation to gravity. And if they grow up with their head crooked, that's the memory spot for that. And that may, re, may cause the apparent recurrence of the head posture after surgery because they're actually neurologically habitually changing their head posture back to where they preferred it. So the head position is really very, very complex. I'm not saying don't treat it, just saying it's very complex. And also vision in these patients is a complex combination of their afferent and efferent system abnormalities. It's not acuity. High spatial frequency letters or letters on a black screen do not reflect visual function of these patients. So how do we treat it? Well, we can treat the problem in the brain or the developmental disturbance uh, as in patients with congenital cataracts, we can improve the sensory system, we can improve the motor system and treat the eye oscillation, or we can treat the symptoms. For instance, uh, what was measured before as photo. I think that understanding that because we can't cure this, if this is not curable like strabismus. And when I talk about treatment, that's, I emphasize that to the families in the same way that I emphasize that to, in strabismus. We don't have a cure because we're not treating the organ. We're not curing it in the organ where the primary problem is. The primary disability, the primary abnormality is the brain in the stagmus, not the eyes. And so until we can get in the, think of it as a seizure disorder. The other metaphor I'll use is, if I treat the hand of a patient with Parkinson's disease, that may make them better able to grip and hold on to and feel things, but that's not getting at the problem in the basal ganglia. It's the same with nystagmus. If I treat the eye and the oculomotor system and the extraocular muscles, that's not getting at the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. If we could reverse the process during development, as in this animal model here of RP65 deficient dogs, where we intervened uh, right at the time they were uh, weaned with subretinal AAV therapy, which is now being used in humans, then you can abort the full development of the nystagmus. And this animal model shows that the nystagmus that developed in this puppy went away after subretinal AAV therapy. Mm -hmm. And this has also been shown in some of the human data. So we'll talk about treatment now. 
Perfect. And these are the broad areas that have been used uh, for, for non-surgical treatment. And these include oral and topical medications, things like VT, orthoptic VT specifically, non-orthoptic VT has even been advocated by some optometrists here in the United States, uh, methods of biofeedback, uh, vibratory stimulation, uh, even air or, or things blowing across the face seems to reduce the nystagmus from proprioceptive input. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. And again, optical treatments like prism telescopes, contact lenses and retinal image stabilization techniques and certain Botox as well has been tried in all forms of nystagmus, including infantile nystagmus. And without going into details on each one of these, again, there's, there's a, a written you can see these written. But this, I put this table up because I use these pretty routinely. I'll use baclofen in INS patients with PAN. Uh, I use, I, I try and treat acquired pendulum nystagmus with Nemenda, followed by uh, baclofen. And in, in uh, downbeat, there's a, a group of patients that will respond to uh, Ampira, which is 3,4-diamine apiridine. And also, uh, I'll work in consultation with some neurologists on some medications I'm not familiar with, but I use baclofen quite a bit. And I'll talk about this in the other treatment uh, for the. So just a quick question. You've got a lot of um, anti-serotonergic, uh, cholinergic, glutamate and GABAergic uh, medications in that list. Which, what, what determines for which condition would you give what medication? Yeah. Well, I do have kind of a recipe depending upon what it is like APN. I'll start with, with Nemenda because it's the best tolerated and it's easy for me to prescribe as an ophthalmologist. The, if I have to use some longer term medications that I'm not familiar with, like the anticholinergics or the neuroleptics, then I'll work with one of my colleagues to do that. So these are the medicines that I'm familiar with that I'll try and work with patients first. And so this is, uh, baclofen, three more, the uh, Ampira and Nemenda are the, are the medicines that I use routinely that I'll, I'll try first. Okay. So I'll talk about surgery now again. This is J.R. Anderson's textbook, a co my copy. And it was the, one of the first editions. This is his picture when I was in Melbourne. I took this picture of him in his lecture hall. And in his textbook, he writes on page 170, the quote that you see here, that he noticed that in 1959, when he operated on patients with a big head posture, that their head position got better, but it also, the nystagmus improved and their vision improved. He noticed this in 1959. Next slide. Yep. So it wasn't until the late 70s, early 80s that John Flynn and Lou DeLosa, again in Boston Palmer, did recordings of eye movements in adult and older children who have had the AK procedure for a head posture and again showed that their nystagmus improved. And they published that in the archives of ophthalmology many years ago. And finally, an animal model of INS developed to try and understand the, uh, yeah, you can stand this, to, to uh, it doesn't matter, each one is fine. To, to an animal model, came out. And this was the achiasmatic Belgian sheepdog. This was discovered by a guy named Robert Williams, who at the time was in the East Coast at, uh, at Dartmouth and then transferred to University of Tennessee in Memphis, which is where we worked with these animals. And this is what one of the dog's brains like. And they had seesaw nystagmus plus typical infantile nystagmus syndrome. So our hypothesis in working with these animals was that maybe there was something just about cutting the muscle that caused the nystagmus to decrease. Yeah, you can stay on this slide. Um, and so what we did was we just, uh, go back to the other slide, I'm sorry. So the results of just cutting the muscle and reattaching it in the animals and then in two human trials are listed in the reference here. Now, next slide. And what happens with just cutting the eye muscle, not moving it, not taking a piece of it out, not moving the eye at all, is the nystagmus changes from what you see on the top to what you see on the bottom. So when you physically, our own eyes, look at the nystagmus, it's still beating at three to five times per second. So it looks like nothing happened. It's like taking your finger and putting it on the pulse of a patient with an arrhythmia and getting, giving them a beta blocker and saying, yeah, I think it's changed. Maybe it has, maybe it hasn't, as opposed to doing EKG. And what you see here is that the intensity of the nystagmus has decreased, 
And the period during each beat of nystagmus where the brain captures the world or foveation has increased substantially. And that improves visual function. All right, next slide. As a result of these procedures, and over the course of the last 15 to 20 years, and operating now on thousands of patients with nystagmus, I've come up with an algorithm for other surgeons to use without eye movement recordings to operate on their patients and have the same effect and outcomes that I've had on the patients we've operated on here. And this is the nine operation algorithm, which has been published in many places. And this is in order of decreasing frequency of the nystagmus procedure that was done. So again, the horizontal head posture alone operation or the old AK what is the most frequent operation that I do, followed second by a chin down head posture where I combine the superior rectus with the inferior oblique. And I do that to create comitants. If you do a vertical r and &R, there's a good article in uh, this month's AJO by Sean Donahue and Jim Law showing that, the, that this operation, as I've shown in many articles, is better than the vertical r and &R because you don't create torsion and you don't create vertical imbalance. And you don't create a significant elevation deficiency so that the patient cannot look up. And this is also true with operation for chin up posture, which is superior oblique tenectomy plus inferior rectus recession. And I do probably one or two of these a week. Last week I did two of chin up operations. These patients do very well by combining oblique plus rectus surgery, creating uh, gaze comitants. And you won't disrupt binocular function. Here's a kid with typical albinism with chin down posture who has, uh, you can hit the slide again, you'll see both of you. <laughs> and uh, the chin up posture and chin down posture is, is corrected. And her eyes are, I mean, this is a dramatic result. You can see the eye movement recordings above and eye movement recordings below after surgery. There's almost no electrophysiological evidence of nystagmus after a BSR BIO operation in this child. Next slide. Keep looking. Look at the camera. Look at yourself. Sorry, Richard. Did you see? That's all right. Sometimes you have to hit it again to get out of the video and go to the next slide. <laughs> so, what, how about visual acuity? Because I can't get a paper published without publishing visual acuity. But I don't know of any strabismus surgeons who improve the alignment or the oculomotor system that have to do acuity before and after their surgical procedures. But for some reason, I can't show that the nystagmus improves alone. I have to show that acuity improves or else I can't get anything published, which is fine. But again, I believe that high spatial frequency acuity or black letters on a white screen do not tell us about how these patients function before and after. Now, some of them can drive after, but so I do it. I do the acuity analysis because I have to, not because I think it's that important. But in general, most patients will get at least a line to three. 15% will get greater than three lines, although there's a ceiling and floor effect because if they come in 2040, they really can't get three lines. But in general, acuity improves in most patients. About 20 to 25% of patients will get no more binocular best corrected acuity after eye muscle surgery, but obtain other benefits. Go ahead, next slide. So what happens with the eccentric null position is that there's a period, there's a position in gaze in three-dimensional space where visual functions are the best, all visual functions, not just acuity. And before we did the analysis of null position movement, it was believed that all that happened was the null position moved from left to center as seen in the upper photographs here. But what actually happens is it moves to center and expands. Next slide. So I described the visual function space. That's a, a term that we're used to describe where the patients function the best. And you can actually measure that by measuring visual functions as a position of gaze, as a function of gaze. So you can turn the patient's head and measure acuity, contrast, motion perception, visual recognition time as a function of gaze, and then plot that out as you see here. Next slide. If that's done before and after surgery in three dimensions, you can get these type of plots. And down to the left, what you see is functional vision space before and after surgery in 85 patients 
and this is the group mean. White area, if this was you or me, the entire rectangle would be white. Mm -hmm. So the more white area that you see, the improvement in functional vision space and where it is in relation to zero gaze. And you can see there's a significant improvement in the three-dimensional area in which vision is, has best function after nystagmus surgery. And that's plotted out above where you can see before after surgery, there's an improvement in horizontal position of best acuity. Next slide. So functional visual space improves. Does letter acuity improve? Well, these are 85 patients with OCA1. This is the worst type of albinism. And these are patients who've come to see me with no treatment, not even glasses. This is patients I've seen in countries around the world. And so there's no glasses, but they're putting glasses. And I see them in glasses. And in their glasses, their best pre-op vision is, any, is a, averaged about 2170. And then after, after surgery, so they've adapted to glasses. And now only after surgery, that's without any other, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. This is a, with all four treatments. So in these patients, I treat all four glasses, um, contact lenses. So I put them in glasses first and adapt them. Then I do surgery. Then uh, I treat them with um, contact lenses and baclofen. So these patients get all of this treatment and their vision improved from 2170 in nothing to 2080 post-op. So with medical, optical, and surgical treatments, their vision has improved and their contrast sensitivity function has improved. Next slide. These are all the things that have been studied before and after eye muscle surgery for nystagmus. And these are the things that get better. It's contrast, acuity, motion perception, functional field of visual uh, uh, of vision, proprioceptive and no, nociceptive receptive response, how fast they recognize the world, what their visual quality of life is. So these things have all been measured and shown to be improved by operating on the eye muscles of patients with infantile nystagmus. Next slide. So what we've learned is that all of the there's beneficial effects that extend beyond the cosmetic appearance of the nystagmus in these patients who have eye muscle surgery. And it's independent of why you operate it, whether you operate just for strabismus, for an eccentric null position, for a null position plus strabismus, or only take the muscles off and put them on. So what is it about operating, next slide, that makes this different? Well, we don't know the answer, but we have some ideas. As a result of this, what we did was develop a technique where we could study where the eye muscle tendon inserts into the globe or an area that I call the enthesis or the enthesial area. This area had not been studied electrophysiologically, pathologically, or genetically, or with uh, uh, special staining until we kind of looked at it because when you cut the eye for pathology, you cut it there and send the eye or you cut it there and send the muscle. So by looking at this area, what was discovered was nerve endings that are proprioceptive afferents and go back to the brain. On another slide, I have a picture of a about 180 or 200 references since this came out of oculomotor physiologists now studying this afferent system. And these nerve endings end in the uh, cerebellum and brainstem in areas of proprioceptive afferent importance. So what we think we're doing is disrupting proprioceptive afferents at the enthesis, interfering with the feedback loop, and causing the gain of the system to decrease. In simple words, is we're exciting proprioceptive afferents, telling the brain to damp the signal to the extraocular muscles, thus slowing the nystagmus down. And this can be maybe can be used for other reasons besides nystagmus in the future. I'm gonna divert a little bit and show you how the observation of patients has helped me in the treatment of these pa of nystagmus patients. I had an adult patient who said that they could see better and the nystagmus was better when he was taking his oral diamox. So we studied his nystagmus on and off oral diamox and showed that as the line goes up, the nystagmus gets better, that on oral diamox, his nystagmus was almost as good as when he had damping with convergence. So then I thought, wow, on oral diamox, this was a case report, topical diamox in the form of brinzolamide may be effective. And it turns out we got the same, pretty close to the same curves on the drops. So next slide. So what we did was plan a clinical trial. And these are five adult patients who had otherwise unremarkable eye exams, except for idiopathic infantile nystagmus. And they had a crossover. They were on placebo or 
Azop and then switched over to Azop or placebo. And you go to the next slide, and I have some, you can look this up, this article up. And it turns out that the Azop improved the waveforms, their, their nystagmus acuity function or the foveation periods, the acuity and their quality of life measures in these five patients. And we think that this worked on the enthesial area. Just, just a yep. point there, Richard. Um, the, yes. So the enthesial area here and central uh, pathway is, uh, has a uh, propensity with the carbonic anhydrase uh, system. I, I, I read the paper, which because uh, when I heard Azopt, my, my mind, uh, I started uh, blinking. And it just says it's five subjects between age 33 and 70, all with virgin eyes. They weren't treated prior. So just a point to ask, um, realistically, do most patients uh, with INS have some sort of intervention? Am, am I right? If, if that's so, are you advocating the use of azopt or brinzolamide in children, and or should we be doing a, a larger study prior to doing so? What's your comment? Well, I think I think a large scale study needs to be done uh, in both pre and post treated surgically patients. I'm not doing that because I'll show you. I have a new drug I've been working with with for 11 years, but right now I use azopt in as an adjunct to surgery. And 50% of the patients that I put on Azop after surgery have a subjective and objective benefit in addition to the surgery and stay on it. Actually, they, they, they call my medical record and say, please refill my Azop, I ran out. <laughs> so I think there may be some combined benefit to the, to the persistence, to an additional benefit. Uh, this is so complex that I don't pretend to understand how one could work, one couldn't, is it all placebo? I think we need to, to do some larger scale studies with it. Is there a central effect? Is it getting absorbed? I don't understand completely all this, but I do use the drop because there's very little downside and the patient, and I check the patients after uh, with testing and if there's objective and subjective improvement, then I'll have them stay on it. Well, well I saw that the, the mean pressure dropped from 15.8 to 12.7 millimeters of mercury. So I'm delighted. Carry on using it. <laughs> <laughs> so this is why I don't do the Azopt anymore. So I had a patient about 11 years ago. This is Ginger, the dog. And you can look at her eyes. You'll see her nystagmus, who uh, was working on his farm and accidentally got a pesticide in one of his eyes and, and went to the house to wash his eye and and uh, what, it didn't bother him too much, a little bit of irritation. But then he noticed about an hour or two later that he could see better and his nystagmus was decreased. He went to his ophthalmologist the next day and the, the ophthalmologist said, yeah, your nystagmus is much better. And then he came to see me about a month later and it still had reduced. Um, this case report is actually, I finally published it because of some other issues with patenting this drug and getting ready to do the research. And so what we did was we started using, we, we took this pesticide and made it into an eye drop with the help of pharmaceutical industry and tested it in animals. And here's, this is Ginger and Scout in my arms here. Next slide. <laughs> and here's uh, Ginger getting tested uh, with the uh, LCL, which is the pesticide we put in her eyes. And this is our nystagmus down on the left. Next slide. And what you see here, you can press the uh, both videos. And this is her, her nystagmus being seen on the left and on the right, there's no nystagmus that's clinically visible at all after the drops. It's gone. And the eye movement recordings show a, a, almost a, a dramatic decrease to almost absent on eye movement recordings as well. And we gave this to her, again, her and Scout, right after weaning, we started the drops. And this was after five days of the drops. There was no side effect except, interestingly, the intraocular pressure reduced by 45% with no side effects. So we, we've actually are studying this drug for glaucoma and for nystagmus as well. It's a, probably a new mechanism drug. So this is my final slide. And I had a picture of Ginger in here too. Ginger is with us right now in Hudson, Ohio. And she's seven years old and very healthy. And she has a brother, Stanley, who she plays with all the time. But this is uh, a friend of mine, Samir. Uh, you probably know Samir. Many of you know Samir Zeki at the, he's a, uh, at the University College in London and is a very famous neuroscientist. And these are the things he told me when I was fighting and still to some degree are fighting the common knowledge that somehow taking a muscle off and putting it on does nothing. How could it possibly do anything? And this is what he told me, which he put in his textbook. And so that really it's, it's 
going to be other scientists in history that really develop an understanding of how these interventions help nystagmus. But I can tell you, after treating thousands of patients over 25 years, all of you who are listening to this have the skill set to help these patients. So the idea that for me, and I still see this every week, and I see people from across the pond and from other continents that say, I was told by my ophthalmologist that nothing can be done. I don't have a problem with them saying, mate, something can be done now. I may not be able to do it, but let me find someone who can is fine. But to say to patients, nothing can be done anymore, I think is inconceivable to me. When mm -hmm. all you have to do is go online and type a couple things. So that's the battle that I'm in now. It's just education. So hopefully forums like this will get the information out and stimulate our colleagues all around the planet to look into how they can use their own skill set to help these patients. That's amazing, amazing, amazing. Thank you so much for that positive message at the end. I'm going to pass over to Maria now. Maria, could you start the questioning for Rich, please? Yes. Um, well, first thing, I just want to let the audience know that we have habilitated the chat, okay? So that if you want to ask him questions, you can uh, put it there. I will also uh, give the word soon to one of our colleagues in Oxford who is... Uh, um, very interested and this he's, uh, did his PhD in my stag in my stag and he would like to ask you some questions uh, Dr. Herder. Mine uh, would be uh, well uh, as you said at the beginning most of them you uh, you answered them through the talk. <laughs> uh, thank you for the effort of staying with us despite all the uh, technical difficulties. Yeah I think this, this connection is working better it seems. <laughs> So, well, just uh, as a reminder, for example, for a person who is just a, like a basic question, um, if a person is in the emergency department or is a general ophthalmologist and a patient with nystagmus ca uh, comes into the clinic, like, well, I have like five um, situation, situations where I usually require or think about requiring an MRI. I don't know if you would find it useful to go through them or if you want to give us uh, the, the, yeah. the situation where you say, I'm getting an MRI now. Yeah, I think that um, we can go both sides with that. So if there's no oscillopsia, then you, you don't need an MRI if they're you know, an older patient, right? It's mm -hmm. like, think about what you would ask a patient with, who comes in the emergency room with strabismus. Mm -hmm. All right, you would ask about the plopia and suppression, how, how long anyone has noticed it. And then you check for comitants and say, okay, it's comitant, so it's super nuclear. I'm not too worried about it. And so I think that, that the skill set is almost the same with nystagmus. And the history is very, very important. It's very important from the family and patients. So that, you know, the, the W's of history that the reporters teach you, what, where, when, why, and how, I, I think you need to do those thoroughly. And if mm -hmm. something is wrong with that, then you get an MRI. If I think you could depend on your neurological colleagues. If you're a neuro-ophthalmologist and you feel comfortable with a general neurological exam, then they, that if you find something abnormal, they need an MRI. Inside the eye, for me, if I see something wrong with the optic nerves, that's a big clue for me. If I see something wrong with the orbit or the optic nerves, then I, then I get an MRI. So I do see a bunch of kids with optic nerve dysplasia or hypoplasia, uh, even if it's asymmetric, and I will get MRIs on those patients. So I think the single largest reason that I order an MRI rather than the neurologist or pediatrician or someone else who's looking at the patient is if I see an optic nerve anomaly. So if the optic nerves look normal, the retina looks normal, there's no historical evidence of anything. They, have, they don't have oscillopsia. There's no neurological symptoms. You can probably feel comfortable. So they, they may not be coming to the ER for, you know, for that reason. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If they're coming to the ER for that reason, then probably it's wise to MRI. <laughs> totally, yeah, that's for sure. And if, for example, as, um, just to remember the kind of nystagmus where we usually say, yeah, get an MRI. For, stagmos, for example, the case about uh, the CISO convergence retraction. I yeah, like I think that know. there's acquired forms of nystagmus that are separate from the, and they, but they're clinically different than INS, right? You know, you don't see horizontal in all positions, long standing. Mm -hmm. So the CMAS box kind of tells you, and then you have the, we do have acquired boxes too. And so clearly, you know, acquired downbeat nystagmus. I think the confusing would be a five-year-old with downbeat, mm -hmm. right? And nothing else wrong because downbeat can be INS too. And so now it's confusing. 
Mm-hmm. And say, okay, I have a five beat who has a jerk down with a slow phase up or jerk up with a slow phase down. I'm not used to seeing that because it's horizontal, right? As a clinician. And they go, oh, okay. So if there's nothing else wrong with the child and the parents say, yeah, it used to wiggle once in a while, but it's a little worse now. It's probably INS with the large vertical component. Mm-hmm. But if they're a little wobbly, they're not eating properly, you know, then you've got to okay. use your other instincts. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if you want to ask a, any more questions in this uh, subject, uh, Mr. Dudley? Uh, or no, I'm going to read a couple of uh, the ones from the group chat. Um, essentially, have you ever seen torsion affect uh, with oblique surgery for vertical head position? You mean, has, uh, has there been a complication with torsion? Yeah. Yeah, so here's the thing about eye muscle surgery. Anything can happen after eye muscle surgery to anybody, and it happens 15 to 20% of the time, and you have to do more surgery. And that's true in nystagmus as well. So it's important to realize that eye muscle surgery is, again, it's not a cure. So I would say that here's my experience with any type of eye muscle surgery for nystagmus. If the patients have good binocular function before surgery, and I do good bilateral symmetric surgery, they're fine after. If the patients have poor binocular function, then anything is possible after because they can't use the eyes together so they can start drifting up or out or in opposite directions. So a secondary strabismus, a cyclovertical strabismus is certainly more plausible. The third situation is when there is a complication, a little hemorrhage or fat adherence or a muscle slips and then they get it and that happens with everybody. So I think that if the patient has good binocular function and they have a chin up or chin down or a turn and you do symmetric surgery, the chances of creating binocular disturbance with a secondary strabismus is very low. Mm-hmm. Perfect. Um, another question is for how long would you persist with medical therapy like baclofen? I know you mentioned that uh, in the uh, beautiful study uh, with the uh, um, um, albinism uh, patients that you had it on like a quadruple therapy, but just a little point on that. Yeah, I use baclofen forever. The pa- and again, now here's the neat, the cool thing about baclofen. Once once the patient family or you determine it works, it doesn't have to have a continuous blood level like many other neurologically acting medications. So the patients can use a PRN. So if they're going to play a sport or they have a date and they want to take 20 milligrams, fine. If they're at home messing around and they don't want to take it, they don't have to take it. So it, it does work like that. Once the, and I have many patients who use a PRN when they go to school or work or they're driving and then at home on the weekend, if they don't want to take one, they don't have to take one. The other thing about Baclofen is that almost all the patients, when you initially start it, they'll have a little bit of sedation for the first day or two, and it's important to give them a week. I usually say, uh, uh, take, take this for at least 10 days, most likely 14, and then we'll get in touch with each other and figure out whether you like it or not, don't like it. And the other, the other medications you alluded to earlier, um, are you following up, them up with pediatricians, neurologists, how often, it's, it's, it how's the monitoring done? Yeah, it depends on the medication and where they are, but I'll ask the pediatrician or neurologist what's their routine, and we try and coordinate visits so that they don't have to make multiple trips. If they have a neurologist or a pediatrician at home in another state or another country, then I'll try and work that out with them as well and say, okay, as long as this is helping you, I want your neurologist to manage the, uh, the uh, gabapentin, for instance, in a choir pendulum and stag, but still manage the gabapentin. Mm-hmm. Maria? Uh, yeah, there's, um, well, I have other questions, but I think maybe it's more interesting the, to, to solve the one from the, from the, from the audience. Uh, so Dr. Sneha Takre asks, a eight-month child with downbeat nystagmus and not giving eye contact, how do we, how do we proceed same patient also has highly tessellated fundus and pale optic disc? Yeah, so I think that's a very interesting patient. And so my workup would include an ERG, VEP, two, I have two genetic panels, each about 600 different genes, one for retinal diseases and one for um, actually systemic and neurological problems like albinism. So I do ERG, VEP, OCT, um, and genetic testing mm-hmm. on those patients. And if they have any signs of systemic syndromic associations, I'll have a geneticist, I have a genetic counselor that comes in and does an exam, looks at their creases and fingers and mm-hmm. all that. So I think that's a particular patient that really needs the full workup. Mm-hmm. That patient's INS 
is it could be associated with a serious genetic problem. And if the patient has optic nerve dysplasia in addition to that, that's physically that you see, or the VEP is down, then they need an MRI as well. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a kid that will re require a full workup, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, another colleague of mine, I was trying to give him the audio because he, um, but yeah, I'm not being so, but he wrote his, he has given his question here. He says, uh, which waveform is associated to ganglion cell function and are they ganglion cells from a specific area? Can you send a reference for this, please? Yeah, so there's a big, there's a debate. I think we've been Irene and the people that wrote the, you can go read the article and then our comments to it. But so the idea that somehow the oscillation of the retinal ganglion cells, whether there is an abnormality in that due to the metabolic disturbance at the membrane causing the retinal ganglion cells to oscillate, that, that I'm not disputing. There could be a disturbance in retinal ganglion cell oscillation or electrical potential. But to have that signal, just briefly, this is the argument, to have that signal be transmitted completely through the afferent system, through the communication system, into the efferent system, and through the brainstem and cerebellum to the eye muscles without any type of neurological manipulation is almost impossible to me. How can that oscillation be directly transmitted as though it's a DC current to the, to the extraocular muscle? It's inconceivable. So I don't think that the retinal oscillation itself as the as the first or primal cause of the dual jerk oscillation is really feasible. And also, there I have patients without retinal disease who have that same exact, no retinal disease, have that same dual jerk waveform, which is what I said. So if it really was the retinal ganglion cell oscillation, then why would I see it in eyes that don't have any retinal disease? Now it is true, Somehow, some of these retinal diseases seem to have a propensity for the dual jerk slow phase waveform. I don't understand how that's connected. It could be that the retinal oscillation is stimulating something centrally that's different than the other waveforms. I'm not arguing with that. But the idea that somehow the, uh, the retinal cell oscillation is transmitted as a DC or direct current to the eye muscles is just the brain is not that simple an organ. It doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. okay. I hope that that's makes sense. Really that, awesome. Thank you, thank you, Richard. That is Ravi, the person that asked the question. Ravi, thank, I, I hope that makes sense, Ravi. <laughs> yeah, it did. Um, I've got a couple of more questions, but I'll let Maria carry on. No, no, and please, if, there's time. If, you, if you want to ask them, Ravi, please. Speak. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, so when you were talking about um, PAN, you mentioned that you would patch the non-preferred eye. Does this imply that there's a dominance effect um, in INS? And what other uh, examples of dominance effects do you know exist? Yeah, so I, I, the reason I, I patched the, the uh, non-preferred eye is because there's fixation instability in the non-preferred eye that you could interpret as pan without eye right. movement, really, right? Okay. Say they're densely amblyopic, right? Then, then you'll see them looking all over the place. You'll think it's pan. So the, re the only way you could diagnose pan is if the brain is attending to an object and the eye is drifting because the motor oscillation is overcoming the attentive fixations that, the, that normally the brain has. And you can see it on eye movement recordings without real good fixation because you can look at the oscillation and its baseline movements of the eye. You can look at the isolation. But you, in clinically, if you want to diagnose it, the only, you have to disregard everything else except the oscillation. So they can't be refixating, they can't be daydreaming, they can't be sleeping, you know what I mean? That's why I haven't pitched, that's why I have you patched the non-preferred eye. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, another question from the audience is, uh, do you do tenotomies for nystagmus with abnormal head posture? I missed part of the lecture, so, sorry, because I am just reading. <laughs> yeah, that's fine, no problem. Um, so tenotomy, right, is part of every single operation. I think what they were asking me is, do I do tenotomy with reattachment alone in lieu of recession or resection for anomalous head postures? And the answer is no. So tenotomy alone, although broadens the null position, doesn't seem to affect a, an eccentric static gaze null like we thought it would. So tenotomy alone, I only do about six to 8% of my operations. 
because mm -hmm. most patients will have an eccentric null position or strabismus or combinations of both of those. So the indication or convergence damping with fusion. So the, the indication for tenotomy alone is very rare. Having said that, if the patient has a, a, a strabismus and a nystagmus and no head posture, and normally I would do a bimedial recession for anisotropia, and they have INS, I will add BLR rectus tenotomies to the BMR recession. Mm -hmm. Which is operation number four or five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in fact, I, I really liked the. Thank you for 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 sharing the that slide where there are like different protocols of surgeries. I I you also answered the questions when I <laughs> that I had prepared because I I was interested in why do you uh, choose to operate on the oblique, for example, when there's a teen. Uh, uh, when there's a vertical nystagmus, why did you choose to test the oblique and not the and not to displace maybe the the, the vertical recti that you would? Um, I don't know if you would like to recommend on that. Or... Yeah, I think that I I think it's much more predictable and much more competent producing to work on the obliques and the recti at the same time because then you've equally affected all three actions. Mm -hmm. The depression, elevation, intorsion, extorsion, or abduction, adduction have been affected in all positions of gaze equally. When you operate only on the vertical recti, then you unequally affect their secondary and tertiary actions. And then you have to start playing with how much do I move, whether I move it a millimeter, do I move the nasal rectus, do I move the... I mean, that's just... To me, that's, that's mousetrap stuff. I mean, that's real black box stuff. Mm -hmm. The black box for doing obliques plus vertical recti and the, the, the etiology and the physiology of doing that is much cleaner than mm -hmm. doing vertical recess for sex. But people do vertical recess for sex because there's fear of operating on the obliques. Mm -hmm. But I operate on the vertical rectus all the time, so I'm not afraid of that. But I don't operate on the obliques all the time, so I'm afraid of that. So it's not science, it's humans that are the problem. <laughs> so just, uh, just in the interest of time, I think I'm gonna close the questioning just there. We've got a few other questions, Richard, which I'll pass on to you. Okay. I just wanna say um, a final thank you. It's been an amazing day. And I, I also just wanted to make a point that uh, um, I love the drug 007, you know, being a huge James <laughs> Bond fan uh, out myself. And for all the James Bond fans out there, an amazing lecture from Dr. Nystagmus, not Dr. No. And remember, when you see conjunctivitis,